Building. A building. Oh, that's spelling. You guys will find out that um, maybe I need to work on my spelling a little bit. That's all right. Body of believers. Body of believers. Yeah. A mixture of belief levels. One more time. A mixture of belief levels? Mixture of belief. So there's a mixture of, of what people believe? Well, yeah. no, I meant more like from seeker to established yeah. followers or okay. disciples. Yeah. <laughs> now we don't know where to put it. <laughs> uh, uh, um, yeah, belief. I will just put that in. That's the least answer then. You have to find that. That's good. Do you have a? Uh, worship. Worship.
Hypocrites. Boring. Hypocrites. That's what I was going to say. Yeah.
It says, you know, God had created us, and he says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, and in his image he created them, male and female he created them. And he gives them instructions. He says, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and do it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over the every living creature. Mm -hmm. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on earth, and every tree that has fruit and seed in it, they will be yours for food, and the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky, and all creations that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give everything green plant for food, and it is it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So it's really, uh, for me, as I was reading this passage, I think about it. God declared, one, that the, the man and woman was created in his image, but then, secondly, he declared that they were good. You notice that they had never done anything at that point. Like, he said, this is good. But all of the things that had been done up to this point was by him. But then the tempter comes into the garden. And remember, he, they, Adam and Eve, they were made in his image, right? They had the... They, were made fully in the image of God. So they had the full character of God. They were they were basically mirror images of God before sin. But the tempter comes in, and what does the tempter uh, say to them? Um, so we're going to look in chapter 3. And the tempter, uh, chapter 3, he says this, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We, might, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And then verse 4, For you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from you when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here's this contrast between what God already declared that they were made in his image and they were good. And then the serpent said, No, you have to eat in order to become like God. So you have to do something in order to become something. But they were already like God, as we just read in the first chapter. So here we see this reversal of God set it up that our, our being, who we are, who he created us to be, we were created in this image, we were created to uh, rule the fish and the birds and the sea, and we were created to multiply, right? Who we are, thinking that, cool, then determines what we do. But we find immediately, then in Genesis 3, a reversal of that. That the enemy said, no, you must eat first, you must do something, and then you will become. And it's an exact, from the very beginning, exact reversal of what God had intended. So now we, we see, um, now we see it affecting everything. So I'm on a university campus um, at Purdue, and I don't know, I haven't been around UW enough to know if the same kind of atmosphere exists here, but I'm pretty sure it does because of how uh, scientific, uh, the scientific environment and all the, um, um, yeah, just hard rigorous study that they go into. But at Purdue, it's, a, it's an engineering school, and um, people come from all over the world, actually 127 different nations there. These are uh, you know, top thinkers, top achievers. And their whole life is wrapped around what they do. And so we have this performance orientation mode where if they aren't performing well in what they, in what they do, they feel very bad about themselves. So if they make an A minus to an A plus, it's a, it's a big deal. It's, they underperform and it reflects on what they think about themselves. It's, again, this reinforcement that what they, what they do tells them who they are. So if they haven't performed well, especially in a rigorous environment like Purdue University, then their image, of their view of themselves 
it decreases, and it plays into all of their emotions. Um, it plays into every day, so um, they can't be happy unless they're performing, unless their professor is happy with them. And it, 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 this this reversal then reflects everything about how they think about themselves. So, how does the gospel change this dynamic? How does it reverse what we think about ourselves? What is it? How does it reverse the church? And many times when we think about um, church, our, our repentance is based, again, on what we do rather than what we believe, who we are. And so we, we find this, I find this at the, uh, on the university. Sometimes I typically want to tell somebody, you know, they're dealing, uh, okay, the, I mean, the, the first one that came to my mind, but anyway, uh, especially when I'm mentoring and counseling with guys, a lot of times it's uh, dealing with uh, pornography issues. So my, my, our, my typical response is, well, stop doing it, right? Like, that's, uh, you're doing this, <laughs> and you need to stop, right? And so stop, and then do something different. And, but when we, again, I'm focusing just on, just on the doing so that it becomes something different. Rather, when we understand the gospel, we understand that it changes who we are, right? In 2 Corinthians, we know that we have become a new creation. We've been changed from the inside out, not by the outside what we do, then changing who we are. We see this um, affirmation of somebody being, before they do this uh, affirmation from God, also in um, Abraham. So Abraham was given the name Father of Many Nations way before he was ever a Father of Many Nations, right? Let's look at the story of Jesus. Jesus. You, um, we won't turn to the story at this moment. But um, Jesus, at his baptism, he comes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is, is, is baptizing people, right? And um, and he says, no, this is, this, I'm not worthy enough to, to baptize you. And Jesus says, you know, this needs to be done, uh, so to fill it all. And Jesus is baptized in by John the Baptist. And as he's baptized, and he comes up, do you remember that the, the scene there that happens? That is a, a, the Holy Spirit, it says, like a dove, the figure of a dove comes and um, baptizes Jesus in, like, in the Holy Spirit. And then there's a voice from heaven. And remember what the, the voice from heaven says? Yeah, this is my son, who I am well pleased. So before Jesus enters into ministry, this is, again, if you know the, the, the chronological order of Jesus' ministry, it's not on earth. This was before he entered into, uh, into ministry, public thing. He wasn't healing people at this point. He wasn't um, preaching at this point. He didn't go to the cross yet. He, it was before any of that happened. God affirms him for who he is before he does anything. And he then repeats that at the end of um, Jesus' time, too. This is my son, who I am well pleased. So his, his being was before his doing. So back to the original question for this morning. The church. Many times we define the church by what we do rather than who we are. So this morning I want to um, take a few minutes and look at the gospel. Remember that is, the gospel is who God is and what he's done. And let's see how that changes who we are, who that, what the gospel makes us. And then we can conclude, hey, what should we be doing in response to who we are? Not what should we do because we're the church, but because of what God has done, it changes who I am, and then I, become, and then I am able to do something different. So, um, let me see if my brakes here is this here. So I want to write down um, four questions. And it was really neat that these, um, again, like I said, that these came out because these are these are who we are kind of things, not just what we do. But um, the, the four questions we want to ask is, who is God? What has he done?
we can get into um, at another time, but uh, how we do it. So what, what would it look like? Uh, but we'll try and move through this a little bit. I think I'm supposed to be done at 12. No. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the gospel then is uh, who, who is God and what has he done? Then we, we see that, that changes who we are, our um, identity. So somebody mentioned family, we're believers. Um, so this is part of our identity. And then it, it changes what we do. So as a church, then we're, we want to look at what God has done. It transfers who we are. So then we live differently amongst to one another and to the world outside. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. And I know this is a familiar set of scripture. The theme for this year is great. Cool. So Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20 is what we're looking at. And typically, we look at this passage, and I know when I was water baptized, and I'm pretty sure it's standard for, for most churches in water baptism, they take this passage, and, um, and it's a literal, it's a formula for water baptism. And so when we're water baptized, usually the minister will say, and the, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we see, um, maybe in a a Western culture, maybe in the American culture, the this pattern here is mostly for a pattern of, of, of baptism, but we don't really understand the implications of the names, of the order of how it's written here. That, that, that these names have significant meaning behind them. Um, so let's read Matthew 28, and I'll just start in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so uh, we see these three names here that, that we are to baptize. And this is so important, like what Dad said, that it's not just um, something that God is revealing to him and revealing to me as I've been at Purdue University, that it's not just my, my responsibility or my obligation, maybe as a, as a minister, to make disciples. That this, if if this um, decree by Jesus was then passed on to every disciple, you know, it's 12 that were there, they pass it on to the next disciple, they pass it on to the next disciples. Then, you know, for me, a little while ago, um, you know, and I received that, uh, I received Jesus and submitted myself to him as my Lord, and then I received these teachings again, right? The teachings have then passed me. Well, then what is my responsibility? If I have been taught to make disciples, that the first disciples were, then my responsibility then is to make disciples. Then if my Chinese friend Hao, that I told his story a few times here, if I meet him and I tell him about Jesus and I make a disciple, now Hao knows Jesus, and then what is his now new responsibility? Then it is to make disciples. So it's for all believers, this decree is for all believers, that all believers are to make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's look here. Who is God? So we, if we see this passage, um, there's three statements about who God is. The first one, let's think about it here, is uh, the Father. So, uh, what is significant about God being our Father? And you guys can answer but uh, what is it about God being our Father? <coughs> what has He done that makes Him our Father? Man. Man. 
He made us, so he, he created us, right? So he's, uh, he's, our, he's our creator. Cares for us, takes care of us. He keep, he takes care of us. <laughs> okay, we can put that over here, but he he cares for us. What else? He adopts us. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what did Jesus use the word Abba? Yes. So the Spirit enables us to call him Abba, or or if we translate that, it's Daddy. So he becomes our Daddy because the Spirit now lives in us. Right? And, and Rachel um, made the point that he has adopted us. Mm -hmm. So, so he's adopted us. And, uh, and we, we see this um, in First John, said, or John chapter 1, it says that the... Um, let's turn there real quick. John chapter 1. Uh, we're going to go start in verse 9. The, uh, John chapter 1, verse 9 says, The true light that gives light to the world, to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world was made. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to those which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of the husband's will, but born of God. And so, mm -hmm. for those who have put our faith in Jesus, then we've been born of God, and now we've become his children. We've been adopted um, by him, and we now are loved. So, if we look at the church, we're asking uh, the question about the church. Who does, who does that make us now who are we? Because God is our Father and we have been adopted. So who are we now? His children. His children. So our relationship to the to God now is we are his children. And then our relationship to one another, what does that change? So now we're brothers and sisters, or we become family. So our identity now changes. So now, so now we are, we're family. Like every time I come up to Madison, it's kind of neat because I do get to interact with my brothers and sisters and go have coffee, a three hour coffee with my brother on a Saturday morning. It's really neat. And, but it hurt. Okay, the, but, but we, become, we become children of God. So that changes how we interact with him. He's now our daddy. So now when we come to him, um, when we, we come to the Father, we, we don't have to come to him as an as a angry judge with him. He, he's our Father. He's our Daddy who loves us. And it changes how we interact with him. But also, as a family, it changes how we interact with one another. So it, it comes to uh, what we do. So I want to put on here, what, is, what has he done? He's also loved us. Mm -hmm. uh, so... What does it change? What do we do for one another? If we're family, you now maybe some of, maybe when we talk about family, maybe you didn't have a, a great family experience. So let's let's think about if we, we had a utopia and <laughs> we could live without heaven. What would it look like to have a, a family of believers? Um, so I I would think, yeah. Well, what would it look like? What would we do? How, we love each other. We would help one another. But it would change 
how we interact with one another. If, if I view um, if, if I view Richard as my brother, it's going to change how we're going to interact. It's not just a, a stranger that I know that I see once a week. No, he's my brother, so I want to care for him. I want to I want to want to pray for my brother. I want to want to know what's going on in his life so I can bear some of his burdens. I want to serve my brother. Um, I want to, you know, we're going to try to meet one another's needs. When we come into a, a gathering on a Sunday morning, or if I'm in, at our house, you know, when I come home, I mean, everybody, it changes how we greet each other when we're family, right? When I greet a stranger, I mean, maybe it's a, you know, a, a, a polite handshake. When I greet family, I mean, it's an all out hug. I mean, it's like there's nothing guarding, we're just, we're, we're family. But if we look at the gospel, the gospel has changed us so that the church now, we're not just strangers meeting on a, or gathering together on a Sunday morning or at a small group meeting. Now we're, whenever we come together, we're family. And that changes things, right? It, it, it goes beyond just the, hey, we're all in the same building on a Sunday morning because we love Catholic City Church. But hey, we're, we're all gathered here because, because the gospel has changed who we are. We're family. So now when we come together, we're going we're gonna to act different towards one another. But it also changes how we interact with the unbeliever. So now, the, uh, so now those who do not believe, they're like potential family members. So it would change things. Instead of, you know, uh, so sometimes I, I get upset um, on campus. We have uh, some non-theists um, that we interact with. Or it's a non-theist club, but there are atheists on campus that we interact with. And they're, they're sometimes really vicious towards us as a, uh, as a Christian uh, group on campus, Christian ministry. And Sometimes I want to get really angry with them and like spitefully, you know, do things back to them that they've done to us. You know, they uh, picketed different things that we've done on campus, or they. And so sometimes in my in my flesh, you know, right, my un, my unredeemed self, <laughs> I just want to lash back in anger towards them, right? I don't know. We got maybe uh, maybe you have know, experienced somebody you know cutting off in traffic, or maybe a neighbor. Um, Jeff Vanderstelt tells a story about a neighbor, and she would always come and and run over, like in her van, she would move their trash cans and like run them over into, into the yard and then back up into her, her space and like all these evil things that she was doing to them. And one day God said, uh, spoke to him and said, what if, because uh, they were getting really angry, you know, and like mad. And one time his wife uh, goes out there and takes a trash, her trash can and like throws it into her yard and gets all, you know, gets all of that. And, and then God spoke to him one day and said, what if you were to view your neighbor like she was your mother or your aunt? Would that change how you interact with her? And of course, they're like, oh yeah, the conviction in his heart, like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I would definitely treat, <laughs> treat her differently. And, and sometimes we don't understand what did we look like before we became him, before we believed how, how jerk-like we were, right? So when I, I, I look at the the, the non-theist group, the atheist group, sometimes I'm like, man, they're, they're a bunch of jerks sometimes, you know, and then, but I don't understand, sometimes I forget the gospel, that prior to me coming to Jesus, I was that same jerk to God. But now, I'm, he loved me anyway, right? He, had, he adopted me anyway, and he sent his son while I was still a sinner, while I was still the jerk. And so now, when I interact with the unbeliever, it changes how I think. Wait, that was me before Jesus. I was that jerk. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to love the jerk. <laughs> like I was loved by God. He gave it all for me. He treated me like I was family before I ever loved him, before I ever had submitted to him. So again, when we, have, when we start with the gospel, it changes who we are and it changes how we act because we understand what's been done to us, who we are in him. So now we're going to do something totally different. We're going to live radically different because we understand that we are loved and we are family. So now I'm going to do something different. Not just, I want to love my neighbor. I'm going to bake them some cookies just because I want to bake them some cookies. You know, uh, I'm not going to just do it because I, I want to get them into the church building. No, I want to love them because I've been loved. I now have a family. I now belong. Hey, I want to love them like that. That changes what we do because of who we are, who we become, what has been done to us. All right. Next, um, any any 
one minute questions now. <laughs> I'm not looking at the time. But any questions about um, this identity change? We've been changed to be family. So now the change is what we do. Right. I'm going to move to the next one. Um, so who God is? God is Father. Uh, and then uh, the second one was God, um, God is Son. The name of the Son, Jesus. But who is, who is Jesus? Redeemer. He's the son of God, right? Redeemer. Son of, God. Yeah. son of man. Sacrifice. He's a sacrifice. Redeemer. He's a redeemer. 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 Jesus, Jesus is um, was also is also king. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, um, if we look at and I, uh, I don't, I'm like debating on like going through all the scripture and then doing <laughs> complete. But uh, Jesus was in um, Philippians. It, it says that he was. Yeah, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, right? Mm -hmm. So he had a, Jesus was king. He was he was um, Lord over all things, but he didn't consider it something to be grasped. He came and served, even to the point of death. So um, Jesus. King Jesus, our Lord Jesus, uh, what, did, what did he do? How did he demonstrate his lordship? <laughs> Conquered death, hell, and grave. It's like, bam, it's over. He humbled. Yeah. So Jesus, though he was king, though he was lord, though he had the right to be worshipped even before he had... Um, Come to come to earth be, before he had hung on the cross, before he rose from the dead and conquered, sent um, sent hell in the grave. Right? He served. <laughs> he served me. He served you. He served the world by paying the debt that we couldn't we couldn't know. by be, by living a life that we couldn't live. Jesus lived the perfect life, and so now my hope is my my hope in him. In his perfect work and not the works that I can accomplish. So, who is God? He's, he is the Son. Jesus is the Son. And so, what did he do? He served us. He served us at the cross. He served us by living the perfect life. He served us by going to the point of death. He, he left everything in, in heaven to become a servant to us. So, who, who does that change us to be? So we know, what do we know about us? Now that, now that those of us have, have received um, Jesus as Lord, those of us that have put our faith in Jesus, what does it change about us as far as um, yeah. What does it change about us? Oh, identity. We're cleansed. We're cleansed, right? Yes. Our identity. Our identity, yeah. Changes who we are. In Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In verse uh, 3, it says this. Praise be to God the Father, our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, in him before the creation of the world to be holy, to be blameless in his sight. He predestined us for adoptions to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his good pleasure. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, to be put into full effect when the times reach their fullest, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. I can read like the whole thing. It talks a whole bunch about um, who we are 
and what he's done in order to do that. But the first and first in the verse three, it says that we have been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And actually, um, in Romans, it also talks about that we have become co-heirs with Christ. So now, I, I would caution to say this, but we have actually become kings. kings. And lords. We have become equal with Jesus. That's crazy to think about. We are now co-heirs with him. So, so he is the firstborn, right? And so he has all the inheritance of heaven. So now we now are also the firstborn with Jesus that we, because we have put our faith in him. So I could put kings here, right? Oh, they would, they would feel really good about ourselves and, and go out and maybe be a little bit too much, right? Co-heirs. But who we are, because Jesus was king and he served, so now we're servants. But we're servants with everything. So we have, ever, we lack nothing. We have the spiritual position in heaven with Jesus. We're co heirs with him. But how do we, uh, but our identity now is servants. And what we're going to do, of course, we, we put this for the first one. For the first one. We're going to serve. So now, every because now I understand, just like Jesus, Jesus had everything. He was in the position of heaven. He had equality with God, but he didn't consider that something to be grasped. He didn't consider that something to hold on to. He let loose of everything, and he came and served. He became nothing. So now, myself, now that I have been, like Matthew 28 says, baptized into the name of Jesus, it changes my identity to be just like Jesus, to where now I become a servant. So now everything I have, whether it be a spiritual blessing that I could say I have peace or I have joy, I have this or I could say my material things that I, I have, everything that I have is not mine. It's been given to me by God. And now with what I have, I become a servant to all. So I want to serve my family. I want to serve the, if I talk about my spiritual family, I want to serve my family. I want to, everything I have is not my own. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to bless you. Whether it become the unbeliever, I want to serve the unbeliever any way I can. If it if it is um, the city, if I look at the city in general, the Mad of Madison, I want to serve the city. I want to bless the city. And how did Jesus do that? He always thought about the others, ex uh, the great, uh, see, the greatest good at his greatest expense. So he's thinking about the greatest good for the other person, us, the sinner, the unbeliever, the the wretched sinners that we were right before Christ. He thought about our greatest good at his greatest expense. Now if our identity has been changed by Jesus and we are now servants, we have everything, but everything we have is now for the greater good of the other, not myself. So I can now, everything I have is I have it with open hand to those who are my family and to those who are the only. It changes what I do, not because I know it's good to give to the poor, or not because I know it's good to give my clothing to the um, to those who are naked, right? Or like uh, Jesus said, it's not, it's not just because it's, I know it's good to visit the prisoner in um, who's in prison. We do all that because we've been we first have been saved, or we have first been served. So when we were naked without clothes, we were clothed with Jesus' righteousness. When we were a, a prisoner, we were visited by Jesus. Jesus actually came in the flesh to earth, right? And lived among us. So we're gonna we're gonna visit the prisoner because Jesus visited us. When we think about giving something to drink, we don't just give it give it something to drink because it's a good thing to do, but it's because it's been done to us. He was the water that when we drink of him we'll never go thirsty again. So we're gonna serve those who are around us by introducing them to the water that never would never goes dry, right? We will never be thirsty again. So our who God is the gospel. Who God is he, Jesus is King. That's the, the identity. He what did he do? He served. Who are we? We become servants, which also have everything, right? So now we're going to serve with everything that we we've been given. <laughs> All right. And the last identity there, in the name that was given, was the Holy Spirit. 
baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what do, what do we know about, about the Holy Spirit? Comforter. He was promised. He was a gift from the Father. His guidance. The comforter. He's a comforter. What's that? Spirit of truth. Spirit of truth, yes. He's a sent one. In verse 12, uh, John 16, 12, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. And I'm like, wow, Jesus, there's, so Jesus said a whole lot, he, he did a whole lot, he taught the disciples a lot. And then, he, he gets, you know, towards the end of John, we're like, you know, getting to the point of him going to heaven, and he's like, there's even more that I want to say to you. There's more things I want to tell you and teach you. Then he says this in 13. But when the Holy, when, but when he, the Spirit of Truth comes; He will guide you into all truth. And so, and also, it also says um, a little earlier that um, when He comes, the Spirit, He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in Him about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see Me no longer and about judgment because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. And so the the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of Truth. He reminds. It, it says also there that um, a little earlier, chapter sixteen, that He's going to remind them of everything that He's taught them. So the, the Holy Spirit is one that convicts us of the sin. He convicts us of the truth. He shows us who Jesus is. He reminds us what He has said to us. He reveals even more about Jesus, the things that He didn't even say in His Word. That the Holy Spirit ex can expand on the truth of who Jesus is. So, um, what has this, uh, the Spirit done? The Spirit. The Spirit reveals truth. He's the revealer of truth. And He reminds us of what has been said, and He, reminds, and he tells us even more of what He is all about revealing truth. So, who are, if we're going to be baptized, um, into the Holy Spirit, um, what kind of identity do we have now? Who, who do we become being baptized into the Spirit of truth? A voice. A voice. That's a good one. That's a good one. So we become a voice. What else? A truth bearer. Testimony. A testimony, yeah. A light and darkness. A light and darkness. Or salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. I like to, um, for Kyle, we use the, the verse, that's 2 Corinthians 5 20. It says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. For an ambassador is one that went, goes and represents truth. Or we can say in um, Acts 1, it says that we are um, witnesses. Right, we become the witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Or uh, I heard like uh, my Jeff Vander still uses the word missionary. Um, but we become sent ones, right? We become I, I'm one of the witnesses. Well, we become witnesses. Witnesses to 
the truth. We become messengers of truth. So, then what do we do? Speak the gospel. So, I said we proclaim the gospel. <laughs> Make disciples. <laughs> convey. Convey the message. Yeah, convey the message. If we're witnesses, then we witness to the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Or if we say we're missionaries, we're, we're sent with the truth. We convey the truth. We speak the truth. So, I want to speak the truth. Maybe I'll add a man love. Man love. <laughs> so, um, and, 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 <laughs> We can find it. we can find that in uh, Ephesians. So even even in Ephesians it says that we should we should speak the truth with it, um, about Jesus. That we should speak it in love. And so it's not just mm -hmm. you know Christian uh, somebody somebody I heard them say it's not just Christian jerk speech. So it's, not, <laughs> it's not just I'm speaking the truth in love. Oh hey that that haircut is a little off. I'm just speaking the truth in love. You know like we kind of play that a little bit. You heard that before. Anyway, sorry that's a little sidetrack, but. But we're going to speak the truth. We're going to speak the truth about Jesus in love. We want to. We want to reveal Jesus. Our whole now, our whole purpose, our identity has been changed. We are, or we can say, like Dad said this morning, we are disciple makers. We are truth speakers. We are revealers of Jesus. Our identity has changed. If we're baptized into the Holy Spirit, we're taking on His identity. And so now, our opportunity is, hey, we get to reveal Jesus. Everything I do, everything I say, the way I live, the way uh, I interact with people, is all now an opportunity to reveal who Jesus is, to reveal the truth, because that's who the Holy Spirit is. That's what He's done to me. It was. It wasn't because I got my act right that now I am a believer. Right? I didn't do anything prior to coming to Jesus to for Jesus for the Father to accept me. I, I didn't clean up my act, I didn't get good enough. No, it was the Holy Spirit that one day convicted me and said, hey, the truth is, you need Jesus. And then at that moment, then I bowed my knee in lordship to Jesus, and I said, yes, I need you. It was a conviction of the Holy Spirit. So now, when I'm interacting with um, unbelievers, I, I always want to be listening to the Holy Spirit, saying, okay, Holy Spirit, how do you want to use me to reveal truth to this individual. This had an opportunity, it was really neat. Five minutes to sell you, sorry, but on Thursday, before we came up, we were at a little community college in, in, what, uh, in Lafayette, and, uh, and we were doing this little table and trying to interact with people, and there was a gentleman that came, uh, and he stood right in front of the, uh, our table, and he was on his phone, he wasn't even interacting with what we were doing at the table, he was just standing there. And he had this he had the Cleveland Cavaliers hat on. And I was like, I just joking with him. I said, so are you a, really a Cavalier fan or are you just a LeBron James fan? You know, and, um, if you guys know anything about basketball, LeBron James is kind of the best player right now, I would think, maybe in my opinion. And uh, he, he returned to Cleveland Cavaliers, and so they're doing well. And so there's a lot of, you know, bandwagon fans. They're just fans of Cleveland Cavaliers. That's LeBron's hat. Anyway, um, so I kind of kind of joked with them about that, and but it entered us into a conversation. And from there, um, I found out he's on the basketball team at Ivy Tech, and he's hoping to get a good GPA so that he can get a scholarship to go to another a uh, little larger school. And we're interacting a little bit further, and um, then he, he sat down behind us and he was telling. He just started saying, "Yeah, you know, I I'm getting my life back together, come back to college." You know, I was in Chicago for a while and was living a, a, the wrong lifestyle. And then I had a, a child. He had a little girl that was born last April. And he said, when I, when I had that child, it kind of changed my life. And I really realized I needed to get my life together and get back to college, get on a better track in life. And um, he had two necklaces on. One was a basketball, a big gold basketball with a little basketball on it. And then the second one was a face of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit just said, ask him, ask him about Jesus. I mean, it's right there. And, on his necklace, and so I said, "So how, you know, how has Jesus um, affected your transformation, your change of lifestyle?" And then, 
it was like, that was what the Holy Spirit wanted me to say to him. And then all of a sudden, he just, I, I kind of say, um, he just threw up on me. But like, he just began to tell me all of his life story from when he was two years old until that point. He's, um, I think he was 20 now, 21 now. And so he just tell me all these different things. And so, at, so as I was talking with him, he was just telling me this whole story. And I was just listening to the Holy Spirit of when he wanted me to speak the truth. And so there was different times. Sometimes he would say things, and I was like, in my flesh, I wanted to like jump on it. Like he told me, you know, I, believe, I kind of believe in Jesus, but I don't believe everything in the Bible is true. And I wanted, like in my flesh, I was like, crap, don't like change it. Like, <laughs> like tell him, no, the whole Bible is true. He can believe it. And the Holy Spirit said, no, just wait. And then a little later, he was telling the story about his um, a church guy that he knew that kind of was the father figure of some guys that played basketball together. And he started telling me, he was like, yeah, you know, this guy, on Sunday morning, I would see him every Sunday morning. He would tell me about Jesus and talk about Jesus. But, man, we would play basketball with him all week long. And I really wanted to know more about Jesus. <laughs> but he wouldn't talk to me about Jesus except for on Sunday morning. And, it, and he was like, man, I really wanted to know more. And, and so God, and then the Holy Spirit kind of spoke to me there. Hey, just invite him to lunch next week and tell him that you'll answer some of his questions. So I said, hey, do you want to get lunch next week? And maybe we can talk a little bit about Jesus. And so he, he agreed. We exchanged numbers. And as he was leaving, I said, hey, I'll, I'll see you next Thursday. And he said, can we meet before then? Like, can we meet, like, on tomorrow? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like well, actually, I'm heading up with Madison anyway. But it was just an opportunity, a conversation about a Cavalier's hat, that then the Holy Spirit gave me opportunity to reveal truth and just talk to him about who Jesus was, that he, that he loved him, and that, that, yeah, that he does want to answer all of the questions that he had about the Bible and um, the willingness to hey, make a disciple. So we originally started with the question of, of what is a church? How do we define the church? So often we define the church, or people in general define the church by our activities, what we do. But it's really important that we understand that our activities come from the gospel. They come from our gospel identity. Because God, he declares who we are before we ever do anything. It was Satan who introduced the idea that, hey, our doing makes us something. Mm -hmm. Eat the fruit, then you'll become like God. But God, that wasn't God's order. God's order was he created them in his image. He created them to be fruitful and multiply. He created them and he said that they were good prior to them doing anything. He did the same thing with Abraham. You're the father of many nations before you had any kid. Jesus, you are my son who I am well pleased before he entered into any kind of ministry. Mm -hmm. Satan is the one that tried to get us convinced that, hey, we just, if we just did this right, or, you know, I don't know, sometimes you guys want to talk about Bible reading. Sometimes I, I don't read my Bible in the morning. Then, then I'm like, all day long I feel bad because I didn't, I didn't read my Bible, and then I'm like convicted. I, oh man, I'm like, and it's not really, sometimes it's not conviction, sometimes it's condemnation. It's mm -hmm. like this feel bad feeling. I feel guilty all day long because I didn't read my Bible. But I, I, that comes from our, our doing, our doing making us who we are. So oh, since I didn't read my Bible, no, I'm a bad Christian. I'm a terrible, <laughs> I'm a terrible son of, of God. I, I, I'm, I'm just worth it that I feel that, you know? But that's, again, that Satan um, order of life that, oh, because I didn't read my Bible, now I'm a bad person. No, I've been made good in Jesus. So now out of my goodness, I desire to read the Word because I want to fellowship with my Father. It's not a task that I have to do. It's mm -hmm. who I am. I love this. Mm -hmm. I love the Word of God. I love hearing from my dad. I love fellowship with the Holy Spirit where he's just revealing the truth to me. And when, when I miss out, I'm sad. Like, I should rather have a, oh man, I missed out on that time this morning. And, and rather than a, oh, I'm guilty. Now I'm a bad <laughs> Christian because I didn't do something right. You can't do anything right, actually. Jesus did it all perfectly. And I'm human and I'm going to fail until I, until I get my glorified body, until I'm in heaven with Jesus, right? So, anyway, that, I don't even know why I said that, but maybe that was for somebody. Don't, you don't, there's no condemnation <laughs> for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? 
we are the righteousness of Christ. And so out of who we are, then we do. Not the other way around. We're doing this, so then we become. Or somehow we think by what we do, then we earn our position or we earn our identity. No, we, our identity has been given to us by what Jesus has done. And he did it perfectly. So now I get to just live in what he has done. Mm-hmm. Our identity. So, uh, this is awesome. I hope it, it helps you even, it, even think through some other things of how am I going to, how am I going to live differently? How am I going to interact as a church body? As a church body, what are we going to, what are we going to do? Not because um, we think it's good to do because we want to reach a city, but because we understand that it's been done from us. So I even say it this way: so I do, I want to live in such a way that it demands a gospel length explanation. I want to live with a gospel motivation. Who God is and what He's done. Not a motivation to earn some identity, not a, a motivation to um, earn a an earn a position, not a um, like my some of my Purdue students, not with a performance orientation. If I perform better, then I'll get a better grade, then I'll earn a better favor. No. I the gospel changes who I am. And now I can live differently because of that. I can rest in what Jesus has done. I can live with the gospel motivation. Why don't we, uh, before we, before I pray, uh, <laughs> take those pictures. <laughs> uh, before, before I pray, does anybody have um, any questions about living from this gospel motivation? Living from what God has done, or who God is and what he's done. And 
and so we kind of like it becomes just this. It comes up that the gospel becomes little, but the gospel is huge. It's, it's who God is and what He's done. It's really big, and it, it has implications to all of life, all of who we are, all of life. So this morning, let's pray. And I just want to ask that um, the Holy Spirit would re begin even more so revealing to us the gospel and how that changes who we are and what we do. Okay. Father, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to speak this morning, to share with uh, this body, your word, with this family, um, your word. Holy Spirit, I thank you uh, that you are the revealer of truth. And Jesus, I thank you that, that you are the king and that you serve each one of us. Jesus, with, without you, oh, I don't even know where I would be without you, Jesus. Because you took your own life and gave it for me. You lived a life that I couldn't live. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you. that you did it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that, that there was a day that you revealed to me um, my sin. You revealed to us our sin, our need for Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would begin and continue to reveal to us more of the gospel, more of the truth. May we receive all that, all that you have for us. May we receive this truth so that it changes us. Holy Spirit, may we be confirmed in our identities. Father, I pray that you would confirm each one of us in our identities, that we are your beloved son and daughters. Father, I pray that that would be confirmed in us. I pray, Father, that you would confirm in us that, that we have been served and that our identity has changed and now we've become the servants of all because we have received every heavenly blessing, that we have been seated on high with Jesus, that we are now co-heirs. Thank you, Father. May you confirm that in us, that that is who we are. Father, would you confirm in us that we are your sent ones, we are your messengers, we are your witnesses, we are your missionaries. We are your ambassadors. Confirm in us our identity. Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us uh, the gospel, who God is and what it's done, so that it changes who we are. Father, I also pray that you would remove from us any condemnation uh, and any guilt associated with us trying to do to become. Father, I know that you know our hearts are, and, and and you love when we spend time with you. We love it when we're in your word with you. We love that fellowship with you. Father, I pray that you would remove any condemnation or any guilt associated with our failure to do good or to, yeah, to do good or to do right. Thank you, Jesus, that you did it all perfectly for us. And now the opportunity is to fellowship with you. Our doing does not um, make, uh, make who we are. Who we are in you determines what we do. Father, help us to make that switch in our life. In Jesus' name.